And I will uh, shortly introduce myself a little bit better, but first of all, I would like to, to uh, welcome you all at the book presentation of Professor Dirk Jan Koch. Today is organized by CUNO and by ESS, and I hope we will have a fruitful, productive, uh, nice, uh, um, actually, uh, t no, how do you say it? Middag. Um, lost my word, sorry, afternoon. <laughs> afternoon with a lot of takeaways that you can all uh, implement as well in your own work. Um, so like I said, my name is Milka and I work for the International Foundation of GroenLinks, so the Green Left Party. And we work in the Southeast European countries in the Middle East on strengthening democracy projects. And there always arise the question in how do you maintain a good international cooperation with respect to sovereignty, um, but also always looking at how can you make it work on a more equal equal matter. And I think uh, a lot of, lot of these topics will be also discussed today. And I'm very happy to present the, the presentation led today by uh, Professor Dirk Jan Koch. So please, uh, I will give you the word right away because we have a very, very tight schedule today. So um, the word is yours, the floor is yours. Great to be here and uh, welcome especially also people online. Uh, I have a, a tendency to move around at the, on the stage but I have been instructed to only stand here otherwise people online won't be able to follow me so I'll do my best. Well, Good afternoon, um, we're going to talk about the book. Uh, I'm very curious to hear all your thoughts and al also hear your questions. Um, and let me start with the inspiration of the book and uh, it started about uh, uh, 14 years ago already, when I was teaching in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and there was a course called International Cooperation and Development. And uh, let me just share 30 seconds of how teaching went there uh, before we, uh, I explain uh, the inspiration of the book. <laughs> So <laughs> still enter, and uh, also if people will enter today, we'll let them in, no, and, and, and no problem. Uh, but I'm glad that I let this uh, lady into the class. Her name is Irene. Uh, because at the end of the um, study program, I asked them, well, in the end, do you think that all this international aid, be it debt relief or peacekeeping missions, uh, do you think it uh, actually helps or hinders the Democratic Republic of the Congo? And she said, yeah, 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 I have the answer to the question. I said, okay, come. She said, yes, it's working. And I asked, well, can you please explain to me how this is working then for you? And she said, well, my cousin is working for this international NGO called Caritas. And uh, he has been receiving a very nice salary for the last 10 years. And he has been paying my tuition fee at high school. He has been paying my tuition fee here at university. And now I'm already enrolled in an internship at the bank. And once, once I graduate, yeah, I'll be hired. And without the support that I've received from my cousin, I would never have been able to have all this education. So yes, international support and aid is definitely working. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, this was not in the theories of change uh, of those organizations. This was not in the log frames. And this was not in the teaching material that I had prepared for the class. So to me, ever since, that has been really my interest in studying development issues. Really, yeah, all those effects which are not intended. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, and I do think that we need to focus on them for at least three reasons. But... I'm sure there's more, but those three are most important for me. One is that it really stops preventable damage to human lives. And uh, for instance, now, as compared to 20 years ago, in a humanitarian system, you see there's much more attention for sexual exploitation and abuse. And I think if we would have started that 25 years ago, many of the scandals and many of the pain that has been created by sexual exploitation and abuse by aid workers could have been avoided. It also makes it possible 
to pull the emergency brake when something is really going wrong in the development sector. Let me just take the example of the, uh, of the uh, volunteerism. So the gap years that many students take before they start university, they go to yeah, a developing country to do good, for instance, go to an orphanage and help orphans there. But now we have been studying those side effects. Uh, yeah, you see that actually there's a lot of side effects to this kind of support. And sometimes those orphans are not even orphans. They have just been recruited to be there. So I think that if you really shed a light on those side effects, you can really pull the emergency brake. And now there's these campaigns being financed to explain youngsters, yeah, don't, uh, don't do this. You know? So this is the second reason. And lastly, is that it really makes the discussion about aid effectiveness a more honest one. I see that there's a big push in the sector to uh, reduce overhead rates. I plead guilty as well as a donor, I think. Uh, you see that happening. It should be below 7%. But if you have a true uh, measure of effectiveness, you should also include, include, it, uh, should include the side effects as well. And if you want to mitigate them, yeah, it costs extra money, you know, uh, if you want to have proper due diligence in place. And by only focusing on reducing the overhead costs, you kind of risk uh, reducing all those due diligence uh, measures and uh, create more havoc. Welcome everybody who came late. Uh, feel free uh, and to find still some seats that are available if you would like to sit because uh, it will last for, for a while, uh, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's here chairs here and people bringing chairs. Is this okay? Yeah? So let's continue then uh, with the next uh, slide. Uh, the good news is that we have an outline of the presentation, but you can influence how my presentation will unfold. So I will start with some things that I had to learn the hard way about unintended effects, and I'll give a very short overview of the top 10 unintended effects that we have found. But then you can vote which ones you would like to focus on more. And uh, we're going to select two, um, and then we're going to uh, move towards the solutions. Okay. So. I see there's a lot of people from the ISS, so I have to make sure that we start with a proper definition. Otherwise, people say, hey, what is your <laughs> definition? So, the consequence of an action which differs from the consequence that was aimed for when starting it. Okay, that's the idea of an unintended effect. And uh, I learned by studying this for the last seven years that there are some misconceptions, some myths. One is that unintended effects can't be anticipated. Well, let me give an example from the humanitarian sector, since we are here with Kuno. Uh, we know now, we anticipate that if we provide in-kind food support to agencies, uh, to, uh, to uh, countries or regions and countries where there's malnutrition, that this has a negative effect for local farmers. Because there's a disincentive for them pr to produce, because food prices are going down. So it can be anticipated. Now it's anticipated, and that brings me to the second myth, can be avoided. What we've seen with food support by humanitarian agencies, they have increasingly shifted to food support, which is not uh, coming from the United States or Canada or the Netherlands, but which is purchased and grown locally. And it was not easy because there was a lot of interest to continue with the food aid in a traditional way, subsidizing actually exports from the developed countries. But if you really pay attention to it, and have a lobby campaign, you can make sure that they are avoided. Which surprised me as well. I always thought that unintended effects would be kind of swept under the carpet, would be downplayed by agencies. But what I've also discovered is that there's also a lot of people who like to make, sure, make them bigger, exaggerate side effects, because they are against all this international solidarity, against all this do-gooding. And they, if they find a small thing that's going wrong, one side effect, they try to make it as big as possible so they can say, well, you should stop with this international solidarity altogether. So once, there, once there's a claim about the side effects, I really try to study it carefully whether it really holds scrutiny. The good news, and I um, the trial will try to convince you that there's also a lot of good news, is that many side effects are actually positive. And uh, we won't have too much time to go into that, but uh, for instance, the cash transfers, which is now quite popular in humanitarian aid, you see that those cash transfers have, have ripple effects uh, one or two years down the line because it creates quite a lot of extra uh, livelihoods for the people who are living in the areas where people receive cash transfers because yeah, um, they sell more stuff. 
Lastly, and that made my research more complicated than I had hoped, I thought, oh, unidentified effects, you can just easily measure them. Because yeah, you can just uh, get some measures and then you're fine. But then it turns out that what is an unintended effect for somebody isn't at all unintended for somebody else. Let me just give an example of the, the per diems or the sitting fees. Many donors try to reduce those sitting fees and those per diems because they say, well, this is overhead. This is uh, uh, making less money for our tar targets. But uh, for many people, for those local government officials, those per diems and those uh, uh, and sitting fees are actually really an important way to supplement their meager incomes. So for them, the reason that they participate in this, for instance, gender training is actually that they get this per diem. So yeah, that made my research quite complicated because yeah, what was turned out to be unintended for me was not unintended at all for the other person. Okay, I see that everybody is like, okay, yeah, I get this, yeah. You can ask questions later. So now we're going to move, and now we're going to speed up the presentation a bit. We're going to go rush through the 10 unintended effects, and then you will have to vote which one you would like to hear more about. Okay? So uh, let me start with the first one, the backlash effects. So uh, we have seen this, for instance, in the Ebola response, in which many of you were active. In the Ebola response, you see that we thought that everybody would be very welcoming of all the international support to, to deal with this terrible disease. But what was happening that quite often those Ebola clinics were being burned down. And the aid workers were very surprised, like, how, why is this happening? We're helping here, right? Well, it turned out that a lot of the local populations thought this, made them think of the colonial historical times when there was also people in uh, white, uh, with white gowns coming and testing medication on them. And they thought, actually, maybe they are not curing Ebola, they are actually bringing Ebola. So that's why they were often chased away. If you would like to know more about this effect, you can vote for number one. I think you'll get the drill. Then the conflict effects. Increasingly, they're being taken into consideration. But for instance, what you see here is that uh, uh, local aid workers or international aid workers can be abducted by rebel leaders who then yeah, pay, uh, live off those ransom payments. And you see this increasingly happening. And it kind of gives extra money for them, for the rebel groups, to continue with their often violent struggle. Let's move to the third one, um, uh, which is uh, the, uh, can we move to the third one? Yes, which are the migration and the resettlement effects. And uh, of course, a lot of money is now being invested in uh, reception of uh, migrants in the regions in the hope that they will stay there. And a lot of things are being provided, for instance, education uh, or tools. But what becomes increasingly clear is that uh, according to some academic studies, this actually increases the, the willingness or the propensity to migrate because people feel now like, hey, I am well equipped to actually enter the labor market somewhere else. So there can be a reverse uh, migration effect. Let's move to the price effects. Um, I see just uh, Joret, our economist, coming in, and uh, he, I've been working with him on this chapter a lot. Uh, what you see that those cash transfers, and we already discussed the positive ripple effects, can have also very localized inflation effects that if um, half of a village receives this cash transfer and you measure the results for them, you'll see positive results. But if you check what's happening with those who are not receiving the cash transfers, for them the prices of eggs or chicken are really increasing. So you have to make sure that you measure the results for everybody in the village, otherwise you overestimate the positive effects. Well, let's move on. To the marginalization effects, this example we already explained. For instance, this is not the only example, but uh, uh, this example of the gap years and the negative effects of that. So we can move on swiftly to the next one, focusing on behavioral side effects. And sometimes when people listen to my presentation, they have the feeling like, oh, everything has so many side effects, should we continue? But uh, I think, to me, it shows also this example that we can learn as a sector. What you've seen in this example, that the microcredit in the beginning, the early phases of microcredit, there has been quite some behavioral negative side effects that the man in the household yeah, found it difficult to stomach that their wife suddenly would get all this extra cash and, and they didn't get anything. So there was a, an increase in domestic violence as a consequence. But what you've seen is that those microfinance institutions have been tracking and monitoring that and have come up with interesting experiments to see how they can reduce this negative side effect. Let's move to the governance effects. And here's just an example, again, related to migration management programs. Uh, you see that governance effects really relate to the social contract. 
and that uh, all those foreign aid inflows to the government, for instance, can really distort the social contract, the relationship between the population and the uh, and the government. And here you see that the government then, <coughs> if the donors ask your migration management centers, they'll probably build it. But uh, yeah, the local population isn't in interested in those migration management centers. They just want to have jobs, right? So you get this increasing, there's a risk that there's an increasing gap between what the population desires and what the government is delivering. And then we're suddenly surprised that there are coup d'etats and things like that. Okay, let's move on. Two or three more to go before you can vote. So please make up your mind already a bit. Uh, there are the uh, negative spillover effects. So, and I think Thea's work has been focusing on as well on that there are hypes. Donors often don't display ra rational behavior. Um, and um, that can have negative repercussions locally. Uh, for instance, that all the attention is drawn to a specific sector or subsector. We've seen that uh, with certain diseases who get all the funding and then yeah, the, the local nurses and doctors, what, what do they do? You know, or Is there still enough attention for boring topics or diseases like the sleeping sickness? Environmental effects, I don't think I need to explain to you. You understand it if you focus not on economic development, which many countries are asking. Yeah, there are effects for biodiversity, CO2 emissions. And this trade-off yeah, uh, is another side effect. And lastly are the ripple effects. And is that often we measure only the effects on the target group, but there's also positive side effects on the non-target group. Uh, we see that, for instance, a lot in agricultural support programs, which many of your organizations also fund. We kind of measure the uptake of the innovations on the farmers that we're targeting. But what we see, actually, if you have a, this broader perspective, also many farmers who are living next to uh, the target area actually take up this innovation. So, I end on a positive note, there's a lot of positive side effects which we kind of underestimate. So now we're going to the see if it works. Uh, uh, you can grab your phone and uh, try to see if you can scan the QR code. And you can vote which one you would like to hear more about. If the QR code doesn't work, you can also fill in this code. Um, WooClap, yeah, WooClap.com. But I think normally the QR code should work. Just give your thumbs up if it if it works. Yeah, okay, good. Don't for, forget to press the submit button, otherwise it doesn't work. Also for the people online, is it working? Yeah. People online, uh, if you have already questions, please think about them. You can already type them in the chat. If you have them, so that's the luxury of being online. You can already start the conversation while the other people here in the room have to wait. Um, okay, I see that everybody has stopped scanning, is in the process of voting, so uh, technical assistance, can you now move to the results slide? Yeah. Okay, and there we go. Okay, good. So I'll be very democratic for once. Let's focus, with your permission, then, on the conflict effects and the governance effects, right? Oh, no, there's a runner-up. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let's ask the panelists, which one should they focus on, behavioral or governance? Oh, uh, governance? Governance, okay. <laughs> so, uh, we can move back to the PowerPoint, and Isabel, she knows exactly on which slide she can find the conflict effects. Uh, we have been rehearsing this, if all goes well. So, uh, the conflict effects. Yeah, you see, it works fine. Yeah. She said, no, you don't need a clicker. I said, no, I do need a clicker. She says, no, you don't need a clicker. And you were right. Yeah. <laughs> um, conflict effects are unintended effects which occur when the external intervention strengthens rebel groups or increases tensions between individuals, communities, ethnic or other groups, and between recipients and non recipients. Let me just show an example of uh, Mary. Mary, uh, she is uh, an international staff, a uh, local staff member of an international NGO working in northern Nigeria. And she says what surprises her in the, uh, in the working on conflict sensitivity, which has, of course, taken off, is that sometimes the human the humanitarian staff themselves are overlooked. So she's explaining that she has been working in northern Nigeria. And uh, for her... Uh, she has really suffered from all the like, secondary trauma from all the abductions that she has seen. 
And she felt that for the international staff members, there was really a tension for their mental uh, health and their, and their well-being. They could do R&R, &R, they, uh, they, psych they got psychological support. But for her, she said, yeah, I'm considered local staff, even though my home is 1,000 kilometers away. I'm not allowed to, to, uh, uh, for R&R, uh, for &R, rest and rehabilitation. And I don't get adequate psychological support. So for me, this is a conflict effect really at the individual level that we sometimes overlook. What does it do for the, uh, for the staffers themselves? But let me make it a bit more academic because of the audience. I know that uh, you like a lot of typology, so the subtypes that we have found for the conflict effects are the direct conflict effects, which means that the services or products provided by the intervention are shifted off by rebel groups or by rogue parts of the army, I have to admit, I have to add, and the groups are strengthened because of the aid. So this is where the conflict sensitivity comes in, right? That we have been increasingly trying to make sure that this negative side effect doesn't take place. One of the reasons that we moved away from food aid, or many of you, to cash aid is that, hmm? that cash aid can be overlooked, can be overcome. Then the indirect conflict effects means that yeah, it can contribute to tensions between those communities. Uh, let me move to uh, the second one, which is the governance effects that we're going to focus on. Also mindful of time. Um, so the governance effects are um, occur when external interventions influence positive or negatively at any potential level the quality and the reach of institutions in the countries where we're operating. Let me give the example of uh, a Turkish professor. And uh, he w uh, wishes to remain anonymous, but he was teaching at uh, Ankara University. And then one Friday afternoon, he received a phone call saying that you're fired. And he was like, OK, why am I fired? I've been, yeah, it's because of the petition you signed. But he says, yeah, I've been signing petitions all the time. Uh, but what, what has changed, according to him, is that when he was fired, it was that the position of the president, Turkish president Erdogan had been really emboldened by all the international support he had received and he needed to deal with the refugee crisis. And then normally there would be, from, the, from, the, from Europe, there would be some criticisms on the human rights records. But now since he is having good blackmail Europe with the refugees and the, and the aid he was receiving, yeah, uh, uh, he could become more autocratic. So that's what we see with the governance effects. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail with all the different subtypes, but we can go to the next slide. Uh, and there you see that uh, uh, the democracy effects uh, are, uh, are one of the side effects. Oh, could you move to the next slide uh, if it's not stuck? Yeah. Oh, um, it went a bit too far. Um, but uh, so there's uh, three different subtypes. There's the democratic side effects. You can move two slides back or something like that. Yeah. There are tax effects, there are corruption effects. Well, if you are interested in them, I cannot discuss them all, but there's the book that you can download for free, of course, or you can even purchase it afterwards. Uh, so, uh, but this is just to give you a flavor. Let me move to the solutions, okay? Because otherwise we get stuck too much in everything that can potentially go wrong. I think one of the important things that I've taken away is that don't do humanitarian aid if your ob objective is not actually humanitarian. You see that often that's going wrong, that we see that something's not really working, but hey, we are rewarding geopolitical allies, or hey, uh, we want them to keep the uh, migrants at a certain place. Then there's more side effects, and then we are more likely to turn a side uh, to blind eye to those side effects. What I hope that we can do together is to overcome certain boundaries to learning that, that I see. And unfortunately, they are uh, at various levels, and I, I experience them myself as well. One is the individual levels to uh, uh, barriers to learning, uh, where you yeah, have some kind of ideological uh, straitjacket in which you are holding yourself uh, uh, captive. But then, and that's a very important one, are the organizational barriers to learning. When, uh, yeah, when there are pressures in your organization that if you see side effects, yeah, you kind of swept them under the carpet because it might do a damage to the organization. And lastly, and that's where I'm most positive about, are the technical boundaries to learning. Of course, now with the big data, with, um, uh, uh, with the satellite imagery that we have, we can really focus much more, uh, overcome those, those boundaries to learning. Okay? Um, yeah, just to give, uh, make 
the overview complete for you, uh, let's take the focus on South Sudan. And I know that many of you are active in South Sudan or have done research in South Sudan. And so the idea of this book is actually that you can make a better calculation or a better judgment on whether you should stay or should go somewhere. So you can really look at the benefits of an intervention and of course millions of people get access to support in South Sudan. But if you are honest and uh, you list the side effects, yeah, you see that it becomes more nuanced whether or not you should stay somewhere. And unfortunately what I see is that humanitarian agencies have been commissioning studies like this but then there's a lot of pressure to not make those reports public because like, oh, it is, yeah, it's scary if you see this. It means that, okay, we're contributing to a lot of side effects. So yeah, this is what I tried to open the, the debate uh, by means of this, this book. Okay, let me try to conclude. I have the feeling that the humanitarian sector and development sector writ large is actually in crisis and, and defense mode. You see that budgets are declining and there's, until now I see like two responses. Some people say, okay, let's just give up. I've given up on uh, international support. Other people say, yeah, we should have more safeguards. We should have more, uh, more checks and balances. But there's also a risk if you do that. Uh, I mean, if you look away, the problems won't go away, of course. But if you have so many checks and balances and bureaucratic procedures, there's also a risk that you are not doing anything anymore, right? So, yeah, what I propose is really more calculated risk taking and to make sure that the risk responds actually to returns and that if there's people really dying, yes, you can take more risks. But in complex emergencies, which have been lasting for a long time, uh, I think we need to recalculate the benefits and, and the costs. Okay, last slide, I think. Uh, and I think we all have a role to play in this. It's not just academia, it's not just uh, the policy makers or the practitioners. And, uh, yeah, what I hope is that we can move away from this 20th century model with linear pro programming, um, yeah, still this colonialist top-down practices to more 21st century kind of humanitarian sector, development sector, which is really focused more on equitable partnerships, evidence-based decision-making, and complexity thinking. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I can only imagine how difficult it must be to wrap it up in like uh, 20, 25 minutes. But I think it gave us a, l a good overview about the book. Um, you voted for the most uh, important topic. So I think, uh, I think this was uh, a really good. Thank you again. Um, we have some time for a small question, maybe one or two. Are there already questions or maybe even thoughts that you would like to share? I have a roving mic somewhere. Eva? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sorry, maybe you can stand can, up and yeah, also tell your that. name. Yeah, and sure. Yeah. Um, good afternoon and thank you for the talk. My name is Goda and I work at the Security Development Nexus. Um, very interesting book. Um, one of the things, I work in um, with youth in Sierra Leone and Zimbabwe. And uh, over the COVID pandemic, what I've observed, the more I work with them, is the education sector. Um, I find that sort of missing in the list, but I'm curious to know what you've observed. What I observe is in the governance effect, um, the people that are in the area that receive aid of some form or charity organization settle down in those areas. Um, they tend to mostly take uh, jobs that are only catering to the NGOs but they forget that they are also supposed to do, say, for example, engineering or medical or law that is supposed to grow the uh, country itself. So I find that the governance effect is also impacting the education and the employment sector. Uh, and I find that really um, one of the biggest problems. So I, I would like to know what you experienced about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you would you like to right away or one maybe one another one? one? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Isabella Taut from Cordaid. Um, you have sometimes the moments you want to ask the question or not, but I will, because I want to challenge you, Derek Jan. Thank you very much for the book. Uh, it's very courageous uh, to discuss about these things, isn't it? Um, what I was thinking about when you enumerated the different uh, dimensions, I was thinking, oh my God, we have to talk about the behavioral one. And 
okay, it didn't make it to the top two or three, fair enough. Why am I saying that? Is that many of the things that you are discussing under all the others have to do with human behavior as well. So what I wanted to ask whether it would be worthwhile, I don't know, I'm sure that many of you are aware of the World Development Report 2015, which is Mind, Society, and Behavior. I think it's the best VDR ever and the least discussed, which is actually doing putting international development on the psychiatrist psychologist couch and discussing from different aspects how the behavior of people in a given setting influence for better or for worse the sustainability of the outcomes or the sustainability of the investment, how do you want to put it? So without, this is not for today, obviously, but I would be very interested, like a next step of your, um, of your uh, uh, thinking whether, uh, I, I don't even recall if anybody had a discussion ever about this thing, maybe to see whether it's worthwhile because the, m the longer I am now this month or something, I have 25 years in the sector and I'm, the, more I, the longer I work and it, the more I think that everything we do, it's a lot depending, the, the success or failure depends on, on whether people want to achieve something or not, isn't it? So thank you. Thank you very much for you uh, to answer these uh, two questions, uh, Dirk Jan. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. So, yeah, thank you uh, for the question, Goda. Indeed, what you are referring to, I call in the book the brain drain effect, right? That that uh, international NGOs or UN agencies or embassies, for that matter, attract the brightest minds and that it kind of skews the 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 career trajectories of many individuals and indeed it, it, it distracts attention and resources away and I think this is one of the issues that we cannot solve as an individual organization alone but we as a sector have to come together to see who, how we can deal with this you know and uh, yeah uh, we see I see that there's not enough collaboration in the sector to take up these these joint challenges so yeah. and to uh, come up with uh, uh, to respond to Isabella's uh, suggestion on the including more this behavioral effects, or I call it also sometimes the psychological yeah, uh, effects, we should do that. Be, I think in development studies and humanitarian studies, we often don't talk enough to the psychologists, and I think we can learn a lot from all the lessons that they have been taking. So yes, definitely, it's a point, uh, point well taken. Yeah. Maybe before we go to the panelists, and I think it's very important to me, Isabel, can we go to the slide with the Feed Forward, gr feed forward group? Because I need to thank some people who, uh, uh, who are here. So, you know, of course, I'm a white man standing here uh, with a stable position in a government uh, ministry, a permanent contract, and uh, that clouds a bit my vision, you know. And I'm very glad that we had a m group of people, very diverse, uh, who kind of made sure that this white gaze of a privileged man was a bit reduced. I'm still there, still leftovers there, but there's two actually former students from the ISS there, uh, so I wanted to s thank them. And th since, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and before we go to the panelists, I want to also thank four women standing, uh, sitting on the first row. <laughs> my mom, my wife, and my two daughters who Aww. supported me uh, in this uh, journey. <laughs> and my father as well, of course. <laughs> Oh, that, that's very nice. Well, uh, thank you so much. And thank you also for the two who, uh, who asked the first two questions. Later on, there will be some room maybe for another or uh, one or two questions. Um, like Dirk Jan just said, uh, we're going now to the panel uh, part of this afternoon. And uh, we have four, um, I would say, amazing uh, panelists here to discuss a little bit more and deeper uh, on the book presentation. The first one I would like to introduce to you all is uh, Thea, Thea Hillhorst. She's a professor of humanitarian studies at ISS. And in 2022, she was awarded with the Spinoza Prize, which, which she established the Humanitarian Study Center based at ISS. Um, I would like to give you the word and I will hope that you would like to share some perspectives and notes with us uh, about the book. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Dirk Jan. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot, the book, isn't it? 
You actually managed what my husband has been trying for 25 years. I was quite speechless <laughs> after the book. <laughs> I did, I've read for quite some hours. I didn't quite know what to say. And I must say, I was also a little bit, uh, I mean, it continues page after page. So this, this, this reaction, like, shouldn't we just quit the whole business, you know, that this Nobel Prize winner said. I can, you know, you start to sort of identify with that in the book. But you also see all those moments where things change. And, and um, the things that, that worry me perhaps most is those big backlash effects eh? where where uh, the unintended effects have are themselves ripple on effects i mean how as a program as a development sector you can deal with these large processes of colonization and the hurt that people feel over that i mean how can you deal with that from your program perspective but you do give pointers eh, on how to do it too but then at the level of programs and sectors, there is where you feel, yeah, this is actually very interesting eh? because there are so many examples of how a slightly different approach could actually make a change. Like your example, of course, it's I'm also quite familiar with when it comes to uh, gender-based violence and um, the responses to gender-based violence and how different it could be if those programs were community-based and taking into account the perspectives of men and women, and not only focus on women to avoid the backlash effects of men. You know, it sounds logical when you say it, and I see it applied in the field, so you think, yeah, at that level, definitely, there is so much possible in those sectoral uh, spaces. But there's also this issue that comes back time and time again. I mean, lessons learned, how do they translate to lessons applied? So what you're also thinking is like, would it really make a difference now that we know, oh, it's about unintended effects? Many of the lessons you mentioned have been learned, not under the heading of unintended effects, but perhaps other has effects. So what comes back to me time and time again when I read is the uh, idea of ignorancy. I mean, people using their agency to be ignorant, to not know to not know the effects of what they are doing, to not know the unintended effects of what they're working on. And that is a business that people are actually very, very good at, at all the levels. And it also happens, like what you're saying, this, this, this person who's writing a book about Mali and is told by her boss, oh, you have to take out uh, those three chapters because we just don't want to know what is going on there and we don't want other people to know. So, so fear-driven, eh? So those are real issues, I think, ignorance and power. And you know that, of course. But what is so interesting that throughout the book, you just keep looking for openings, how to learn the lessons, how to apply the lessons. And that is also the power of your book, isn't it? And uh, I must say, you're a really great writer. I really liked reading your book. But even more than a great writer, I think you're a great teacher. And uh, the way you're standing there in DRC is just like you're standing here with this um, amazing kind of charisma as a teacher. And you somehow seem to inspire us to think, yes, of course it's possible. Yes, we can do it. Let's just you know, take the unintended effects into account and we make them into intended really good outcomes and we're going to do it. So I see you as well. And it's so important that we inspire new generations the younger people who now enter the ministries, who go into the programs, who read your book and can really make a difference. Every new generation, you just hope it's, it's your platform now and you can make the change. And that is what you inspire every day, I think, in your teaching. So apart from many people buying the book or downloading the book and reading the book, I also hope that you will have very many, many presentations of your book and being able to just, you know, talk to audiences and engage in discussion about these unintended effects. I think that will really make a difference within the ministry, of course, but also outside of it. Yeah. Thank you, Thea, for your, I think, extremely nice and kind words. And I completely uh, agree, actually, that this should not be only a book on the shelf, but we should definitely have more talks about this and hopefully um, also inspire new generations. But even gen generations now who are still working, I think, in the organizations here or there. So thank you so much. 
Um, the second panelist I would like to introduce is Stein Janssen. She's a development diplomat and currently she's also the senior advisor to the Director General for Development Cooperation and Deputy Head of the Bureau for the International Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yes. Wow, that's I, I, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I practiced. No. But, uh, <laughs> And uh, also from you, some reflections and some words about the book. Uh, we would really appreciate it as well. So the floor is yours. You. I think you can get the mic. It's on already. Yeah, OK, good. Um, well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, kudos for you that you were able to pronounce that whole sentence uh, all at once. I uh, somehow never um, seem to be able to do that as fluently as you just did. Um, well, I very much agree with uh, uh, Thea on how uh, impressive and how inspirational the, the book is. I think it's a very important book. Um, and I very much look forward to discussing it with my colleagues uh, in the ministry, um, as we have already planned uh, to do. Um, I just wanted to go back to when we both uh, started our careers uh, in the ministry, uh, in the civil society division, and that's how we know each other. Um, back in that day, and you described this in your book as well, is when you um, still believed in linear processes of, of development, you have your input, your output, your outcome, and, and then your sustainable uh, effects. Um, well, um, I'm very happy that you've reached the conclusion now <laughs> that complexity theory actually describes the real world a lot better. Uh, because. I think that the real world is not made up of straight lines, but is actually more like a bowl of spaghetti. And uh, what the um, mistake would be, um, what the, a conclusion from your book would be that I would think is a mistake, is that what we have to do is disentangle that bowl of spaghetti, eh? get them all out and make them into straight lines again. Um, what I think the conclusion is that we should just accept that it's a bowl of spaghetti that what we should do is dive into the bowl of spaghetti, um, try to understand as much as, as you can, but de design your systems in a way that the people who are underground closest to it are able to manage the bowl of spaghetti. Um, and that means less policy making here in The Hague, here in, in, in capitals and, and in uh, international NGOs, but more delegation to as close as the, 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 the real world as possible. Talking about the systems world and the real world. Um, so adaptive programming is basically, and you, this is also one of the pleas in your book, is to do more uh, about adaptive programming. And I fully, fully uh, agree. Um, I still think we have to learn better. Um, and we also have to focus on why the lessons that we have learned were not applied, um, because we are also failing uh, to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that within the ministry, um, we have improved our monitoring, evaluation, and learning uh, instruments a lot. We've come far away, a, a long way, I really believe that. But still, we're failing. And if, if you look at the complexity of the bowl of spaghetti, um, let's be honest, we're going to keep on failing. We're going to keep on doing things wrong. And we're going to keep on finding effects that we haven't um, uh, planned for. And we are going to, um, we're going to fail. Um, but just failing at a higher level, to misquote you. <laughs> um, then, um, so we have to keep on learning uh, and we have to still absolutely look look at the, the, the evidence that is available and um, try to develop our design in a way that we look at that evidence more. Um, we should also do more deliberate risk taking. And uh, OK, one minute, sorry. I was looking at my paper not to see you, but I, OK, I have, I have seen you. Um, yesterday, there was a presentation by the chair of the, the OECD DAC um, um, because there was a peer review of Dutch development aid, and, um, and he also um, really pleaded for deliberate risk taking. Um, and well, this is, this is also, of course, very much in, in, in your book. 
make sure that you uh, um, are aware of what your own risk appetite is and also uh, tweak that to the, to the context where you uh, are operating in. Um, and then I had a question for you. <laughs> what, so what is next? I mean, in your uh, analysis, you, um, you put a lot of emphasis on the social contract in uh, describing why in one situation um, there's more uh, positive side effects uh, of development aid and in another context there's more negative ones. Um, so is your next research um, area going to be in that social contract? Is that a short answer, or Okay. Okay. Stay tuned. The answer will come soon. Thank you. Thank you so much as well for sharing your perspective and uh, uh, and also for the question. I think uh, everyone is uh, really excited uh, what what the answer will be. So thank you for that. And then uh, on my right, I will uh, like to present you the next uh, panelist, and that's uh, Su Young Lai, and she's the head of the humanitarian action uh, at Oxfam Novib, and she's also the chair of the steering uh, group of Kuno, the Dutch knowledge platform for humanitarian knowledge exchange, which is also one of the organizers of uh, today's presentation. So uh, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Milka. Well, I also want to extend my congratulations to you, dear Kion. I really, really enjoyed reading the book. I've, uh, I was able to get a PDF copy and I've uh, you know, circled many, many things. And also really a kudo to your employer, the, Min uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because I think you were, I found you remarkably candid and uh, you're still <laughs> an employee at the ministry. So I thought uh, that was really good, you know? I mean, yeah, <laughs> sure. But I got a feeling that you were able to speak in a very open manner, no taboos, you know, whether it's about things like, uh, you know, Know, talking about transactional sex, things about you know zero tolerance to to corruption. So yeah, so thank you for being so so open about these things. What I found very very interesting is that you have in your book given terminology to a lot of the phenomena that we see happen in uh, in our work, but that actually when you give a word to it, you can it becomes real and people can start to act on it. And I can give a very, very concrete example. So earlier this week, I and a colleague were talking about the potential unintended consequences of certain uh, clean energy programming. And then I made specific reference to your book because I had just read the relevant section. And then the colleague said, yes, yes, that's exactly, I know this. I know this ha has happened in India, but I didn't know if I could actually share it. Mm -hmm. And then because there's like a concrete term, it exists, people felt more open to talk about it. So I think, thank you for that, you know, yeah, by giving terms to things we see, it actually exists and we can then do something about it. I thought, yeah, I very much agree with what you say about stressing the importance of complexity thinking and designing the organization for complexity. But uh, I also know, working in a large institution, how hard that is, you know, and how we're so stuck to log frame, proposals, evaluations, timelines, and that being able to be very adaptive, as you said, you know, the adaptive programming, that it's so incredibly hard. But that doesn't excuse us. But uh, I think the next step is really for all of us to think about yeah, we know we cannot think linear, we have to think complex, but how do we then really translate that? Um, yeah, I'm really happy that Kuno is, of course, one of the organizing parties to this conversation, because I think you also stressed the importance of having open and honest conversations about the impacts or the lack thereof, intended, unintended, and to have a surf safe learning environment. And yeah, you know, I've been involved uh, in Kuno for a number of years, so I also know that despite the best intention to do that, it is so hard even when we do our best to create these very safe, closed spaces because of issues like, you know, maybe, yeah, sense of competition, donor funding, it is very, very hard to be open and candid and to have those open conversations. And I think your book is a really good reminder that we really need to do that. And of course, linked to that is also, we all know that we have need to have honest conversations and then to learn, but about those institutional boundaries that really prevent the learning. So we may know something is not going well, we may know that there are bad unintended consequences, but because of, yeah, you know, certain political agendas, we just don't change course. And that also reminds me of a booklet that Kuno recently published about 20 years of Netherlands engagement in Afghanistan and how, you know, many, many evaluations came out, many programs programs happened and we were all saying kind of, oh, 
Generally speaking, it's going in the right direction. But if you really looked, you know that was not the case. And yeah, also about you know evaluators and researchers being very donor dependent. And yeah, what does that mean for honesty and being really open? Um, then also to finish, I do have to say it was a relief and really encouraging to read that aid is not all doom and gloom, but actually it is possible to improve through adaptation and collective action. And I think you mentioned a couple of really good examples, you know, kind of the vertical programming with HIV AIDS with the negative impacts of that. And then with the COVID response, much more horizontal programming. So I thought that was very encouraging. You also referenced in your presentation about the increased focus on conflict sensitivity nowadays. So I think that is good. And and that also that things like fungibility effects are not as bad as often thought, <laughs> relief as well. And uh, that a lot of the positive effects are have, have been systematically underestimated. Now, to finish, I also wanted to just share two things that potentially I missed, you know, I, I would like to see more of. One is you talk about the unintended consequences of aid, but to what extent are we not really talking about the unintended unintended consequences of policy. So by focusing down on aid, it's as again, we have to justify aid, whilst I think all policies have, you know, unintended consequences, good and bad. And then, yeah, perhaps I would also be very interested to hear more about how you look at development aid versus uh, humanitarian aid, the pros and cons there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your time, your feeling for timing is uh, very good because it was exactly the five minutes. So thank you very much. These are again some questions for you, but maybe after all the panelists, uh, Dirk Jan, you can have a small reflections and give answers uh, to the questions being asked. I would like to introduce to you all the last uh, panelists uh, for today, and that's John Cruzzati Constantin, and he's an assistant professor of uh, development economics at ISS, and his focus is the use of geospatial data to assess the impact of global economic policies on development. And uh, I'm also very interested, like all of us, I think, to hear your perspectives. Mm -hmm. and, uh, thank, you, thank you, thank you. The first thing that I want to say is that I don't know if, if it is the best idea to finish the panel discussion with a boring academic economist. Um, but luckily, the organization also told me to cut down on the comments that I had. So we don't, you know, bore people to death. But in any case, jokes apart, uh, I have to say that I agree with my uh, doctoral supervisor. Uh, Axel Dre says that this is a five stars book, and I agree with that. It has covered mostly the the latent discussions and also the very evident discussions in the literature. And I think you do a great job at doing that. It's very complete. Now. I have divided my comments in the way which the, you know, boring academic economists do, both in the positive dimension and the less positive dimension, if you will. I hope you can take some of the comments for the next editions, because I'm sure that you're gonna repeat the, the exercise in the following years. Um, so let's start with what, which I think is the, the most relevant contribution, and that is the common framework. You are giving us, as researchers, a common ground in terms of the empirical and theoretical framework that we can recur to. Now we have that citation, so I think you will have many, many citations. So from a research point of view, that just should be very good for you, at least. I like the call to both qualitative and quantitative evidence, something that is should be very common, but it's not. Normally, they are very diverse, and you have included uh, references to very serious qualitative and quantitative evidence, and I think this is something that we should applaud. applaud. Um, also, I value the effort to try to give us a, a common dictionary for policymakers, researchers, and practitioners. Sometimes when we are in these discussions, it seems like we speak different languages, and by the end of the book, there is a very potent tool that I think is flying under the radar, which is the cheat sheet of what to expect in these meetings. And I you know, urge you to the practitioners, policymakers, and researchers to have a look on that cheat sheet because it gives you a lot of uh, the framework that you should expect in these conversations. Um, more in the topical part, what I like is that you don't take into the this discourse that China is always bad, the Chinese aid at least is bad. Rather, you focus on what the recipient countries can do in order to improve that Chinese aid. 
because Chinese aid normally is very lenient to change practices. And this is something, I think this is a very good lesson, not to take Chinese aid as a the rogue donor, which is sadly the way in which some authors refer to it. Now on the less positive side, <laughs> I have many comments, I will send them to you. <laughs> but sadly I can only mention three because of time. Um, first of all, you do mention or you uh, make use of quantitative evidence, but never in the book, at least you mentioned the betas or the main estimators, so to give an idea of the size of the effect. Some of those effects are very consistent, and as cons consistent in various contexts, you at least could mention what is the size of that effect. Think about favoritism, at least, in which we all know that it's around 10% from the many, many papers that have studied the effects of favoritism that you do mention, by the way. Um, something that I would have liked to see in terms of topics that I didn't see much, um, the effects on soft power of aid. So both Western and non-Western aid have been shown to have some effects on um, cultural practices, norms, Think about, for instance, the work of James Freeland, Axel Dre, that you mentioned a lot in the book, in which they find that US aid is associated to the way in which recipient countries vote in the parliament of the UN or the Security Council, or how work like Lucas Velda now uh, find that Chinese aid is changing the attitude towards China in the places where the aid projects are located. Also, another topic that I would have liked to see is related to the market of aid. And basically what I mean with this is how donors react to other donors. So think about the work of Geda Asmus, Vera Eichenhauer, in which they find that, for instance, in their case, India, India's aid react to Chinese aid in the way that they go to the places where the Chinese aid has, go has gone. Um, you can also find some suggested evidence with work with Dre and, and, and Matsad in which we find that Chinese aid, at least in the health sector, is crowding out World Bank's aid. Finally, sorry, I'm way over time, sorry, sorry. Um, right to the end, you make the claim that the, the ones on my spectrum, the researchers that do this impact analysis, we do it in an incomplete and incorrect manner. I, I'm with you in that it's incomplete because we should look more for general equilibrium models and try to really see which effects are dominating which, to see what is the overall effect, whether positive or negative, but incorrect, nah, not so sure. <laughs> think, it, think about a journey. To, to get to the destination, you have to take several steps. I would call each of those steps incomplete, but I would never call them incorrect. They are all conducive to the same goal, which is get to the destination. And in that sense, the impact analysis that we do are those steps. And maybe the challenge is, you know, make a coherent narration of those steps so to understand better the overall effect of aid. With that, I will finish. Sorry with the organization. And thanks for everything. Everything looks amazing. And thanks for the invitation. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, John, as well. So I think there can we have heard a lot of a lot of different perspective from going from donor relations to uh, incomplete versus um, what was it incomplete and versus incorrect. I'm gonna call the battle like that. Oh, there is no, there is one there, right? There should be one there. No, we had only one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> no worries. Um, so we heard a, a lot of a lot of uh, perspective and also questions actually uh, towards you, Dirkion. Maybe a small small reflection on it because uh, yeah. So maybe yeah. you can first give a small reflection yeah. on everything you've heard, and then we can go on to the audience and uh, receive some more questions from you. Mm. Yeah, so I wanted to respond to Stein's question on my next book project, but now I heard the comments from John, and I think <laughs> I have to rework the current <laughs> book project a bit. So, uh, 
you will also get a meal with more points. Yeah, apparently. So this yeah. was just the tip of the iceberg, apparently. So, no, well, thank you for that. Well, thank you for your question, Stein. And to be honest, even before John's comments, I, I, I don't have a clue. So let me just focus on this one, making sure that I have all those discussions that, that uh, to actually make sure that the book is picked up. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just respond very briefly to uh, the differences, actually, that uh, Suling asked between the humanitarian sector and the development sector. I think they share a lot of uh, similar characteristics, but what I see in the humanitarian sector is that we really have this really, uh, uh, I, th I think, somehow ideological blindness with respect to neutrality. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you have this really strong belief in one's principle, sometimes you forget that you know, times are changing and situations are changing, and it clouds really objective thinking if you have this religious belief in one principle. Uh, so I think that's the particular challenge actually for the humanitarian sector as opposed to the development sector to see how we can make that fit for the 21st uh, century. Um, and I think uh, Suling and John, uh, both of your con uh, uh, questions relate a bit to the broader political economy and the broader political issues that are at play. And uh, you say, well, you focus a lot on aid but what are the other policies happening and what are the side effects of those other policies? I think it's, that's a point well taken. Uh, what are the side effects of our trade policy? What are the side effects of our climate policies or the absence of our climate policies? Yeah, and I think it would be much fairer to also include those. But uh, yeah, I try to take a bit of a tunnel vision, uh, to be honest, and only focus uh, on this uh, as one step to this broader analysis. So um, let me uh, see. I think I'll leave it at... Uh, 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 at that, uh, yeah, and I, and I take your point, uh, point well taken on the size of the effects, on being sometimes a bit harsh on the, on the, on the economists, uh, <laughs> even though I was trained by my PhD supervisor, was <laughs> apologies for <to> your <laughs> uh, himself, but uh, let's continue that dis uh, discussion then, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. And, um, to you, all of you, I mean, I'm sure you've uh, listened with a lot of uh, passion to this uh, great speaker. So maybe there is a question to one of the panelists, or maybe there is a general question or something that you would like to share. And I was actually also wondering if everything that we've heard today, if this is something that you recognize a lot, what do you recognize within working within your own organization? But also, is it something that you can, what, do you, what is like your takeaway actually? So um, I'm just, Throwing it in there, I know it's a lot, but maybe there's already some things that you already thought about or maybe even before. So who can I give the mic? Okay, I, okay thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> very simple. You have publicized could you, this book. Could you, uh, maybe, no, 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 it's, it's on. But maybe stand up and also say who you are and where you work. I'm Hugo Oostkamp, uh, independent consultant in the water and sanitation sector. <laughs> One question, uh, Dirk Jan. You have publicized this book. What are the in in unintended consequences of the publication? <laughs> are people going to cherry pick? Are, you know, what are the effects of publicizing such a book? That's it. Thank you. Okay, maybe another question, uh, whether it's to Dirk Jan or one of the panelists. <laughs> so it's still Isabella from Cordate. Uh, about the adaptive programming, yes, and what you said about the deliberate risk taking. What we find in our organization is indeed we need to work in a different way. Adaptive programming, it's not only deliberate risk taking, but deliberate risk sharing. So what I wanted to ask whether you have considered the, the shared risk uh, management and what kind, what is the quality of partnerships? I'm not talking partnerships, but the quality of the partnerships that lays, you know, that substantiates this kind of uh, risk sharing. And it's not only between us as NGOs, globally, but also with the government, also with other stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you can already answer these two questions. Thank you uh, uh, for the question on the potential side effects of the book. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, that was the question. And, uh, you know, I'm always a bit afraid when I publish a book or an opinion piece because I'm afraid that maybe it will be instrumentalized by people who are opposing international solidarity and say, well, you see, there are so many side effects, so we should just stop with it. Um, so I got also a message from the Telegraph yesterday. I was like, oh, no, they have read the book, and now I have to answer <laughs> questions. But luckily, it was about something totally different. So I was like, okay, <laughs> thank God. So, no, I think that that really scares me sometimes. Uh, but at the same time, I think it shouldn't uh, paralyze us and say, okay, well, let's not have this debate. Let's not have this discussion. Because if you don't let shed a light on things that are not going right, the uh, problems can fester uh, and it can grow. And then the problems only become bigger. And the scandal, in the end, becomes bigger. So that's why I really propose to have this discussion, even though sometimes yeah, it can be uh, quite awkward and uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so, so far, no unintended side effects. Let's try to keep it like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the question, sorry for the people online, uh, they c yeah, he didn't have the mic anymore, but yeah. I, am I afraid of cherry-picking ideas that certain effects would be taken more at heart than others? You know, I would already be glad if policymakers would be cherry-picking ideas, actually. <laughs> so in that sense, I'm quite modest in the ambitions, and I think for every situation, different unintended effects are more important, and, and many people can select better what actually deserves more attention in their, in their uh, situation. So I'm not that afraid of that. Uh, Isabel, thank you for your uh, uh, for your question and and um, you ask about partnerships and about uh, shared risk uh, risk sharing, and I do think it's it's a very important one. Taya wrote a beautiful report four years ago at the request of the ministry on one element of risk sharing in the sector: the ombudsperson in humanitarian aid, claiming that everybody anywhere in the world which is receiving or affected by international humanitarian support should have a phone number to call. A very simple suggestion, a risk share mechanism, because then every agency doesn't have to have their own procedure, it can be just one worldwide number. Well, it was a great idea, you came with very specific examples how to do this risk sharing, because it's complicated, but yeah, sometimes you propose things and it doesn't happen, you know? So, no, I think it's, uh, what you say, it's very important, risk sharing, especially in the humanitarian sector, we still have a long way to go, and I think it's also up to my government our government to, to really push for that because now often we propose a stimulate competition between agencies in instead of stimulating this, this cooperation so yeah i also look at my own uh, government to to focus more on that thank you thank you so much we also uh thank you i will come back to you very soon we just also received some questions online so i would like to uh qu a question uh, any thoughts on unusual actors in the field who may be unattended development actors too? Um, I think, for example, smugglers as source of employment in collapsing economies. From Eric Gutierrez. Mm. I see you have to think about that one. I will just go to the next one. Yeah. yeah. yeah? <laughs> Another question also uh, online, thank you, Noe Mon Mendoza. Would you relate the crisis and defense mode of the humanitarian sector with the debate among institutional scholars around whether it's possible to design institutions? Can you repeat that one? Yes. The whole sentence, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. It was a long one, but okay. Uh, would you relate the crisis and defense mode of the humanitarian sector with the debate among institutional scholars around whether it is possible to design institutions? I think I need some help from the panelists as well to answer some of the questions. I think that's fine. The people online yes. are asking very tough questions to me today. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> maybe they've been already discussing amongst themselves what they're going to do. So, Eric, thank you so much eh, for your question. You must be watching there. Thank you. And uh, so uh, you are indeed referring to the unintended actors or those who are not really part of the system but having a large in, uh, influence on the system. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think uh, um, that's very interesting. What you see, actually, is that... Uh, the consultants that we send out to evaluate programs tend to really focus on the established actors and they can get interviews with the established actors. But what we see often is that in many of the well-intentioned efforts, 
those uh, other actors also play a very important role. And this is where anthropologists become very important. Mm -hmm. They often stay longer term in a specific community and know also the more illicit processes that are going on. And unfortunately, many of the evaluators, the consultants sent from the Netherlands or Europe to spend two weeks or three weeks somewhere, yeah, don't catch up on all, the, all those illicit actors or illicit actions. So uh, smuggling of, uh, um, of conflict minerals, but also of aid goods, yeah, it's something that I think merits much more attention. And uh, even in my book, I think, in the second edition, which I have to write anyway, <laughs> we, uh, we can focus uh, on Ma that. Maybe someone would like to, to add on this answer as well. Thea? Not really. No. no. <laughs> or someone else? Well, just feel yeah. free. Then we'll go the to your next question. The second question I pass on is a bit uh, too uh, difficult. Too right difficult. Yeah. Okay. If there's anyone yeah, else but, uh, who feels can I? I just wanted to say to the person online. I think it's a really interesting question because we seem to forget. You know, we always talk about uh, engineer, social engineering, as a, as a, as if it's a really dirty word. But uh, I think it's actually super interesting to think of whether it's possible or not to change institutions, design them slightly different than they are. So I think I just wanted to thank for the challenge that was online there. Yeah. Thank you. And then we had also a question here. If <coughs> Thanks. Uh, my name is Arjun, uh, Arjun Bedi, and I'm a professor of development economics, so uh, along with John. So I had a question on, uh, with St uh, to Stein that you said, uh, let's embrace complexity, fair enough. Then you said we will keep failing. So I want to understand what you meant by that, we will keep failing. And second, if we are going to keep failing, then is there a point to carrying on? <laughs> or what do we need to do in order to carry, to carry on? Do we need to take small steps? Do we need to do more of evaluation? Or what is needed to prevent or reduce the extent of failure? But first, what do you mean by failing? And then uh, the rest of it. Thanks. Uh, Fortunately, that's a very easy question, yeah. <laughs> so what do I mean um, with failing? I think failing can take uh, many uh, shapes and, and forms, but um, one form of failing is, of course, not, um, not getting the intended effect that you are looking for um, or getting less of it. Um, failing, um, but it also has to do with the way you look at it. Because if you say, okay, we have not completely uh, achieved what we wanted to achieve on the outset, but we have um, had these positive ripple effects, um, and, and, and maybe if you look at it differently, it's not, not failure uh, uh, so much. Um, we will keep on failing. Yeah, I, th I think that's just the messiness of, of, of the spaghetti ball that we're in. Um, um, if, if things were simple, we could just learn the lesson, um, you know, evaluate something, learn the lesson, incorporate it into design, and then make sure that um, it will not happen in the future. And I don't think it's that simple. I actually, I, well, I think we know it's not that simple. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so what I think we have to do is embrace the fact that we uh, that we fail, and what we organised in the in the ministry was a was a fail fest, where uh, we invited uh, six of our colleagues, including the director general, to um, uh, tell uh, us a personal story of failure. Um, so what went wrong? Why did it uh, go wrong? What was the lesson? But sometimes also there was no lesson. We just tried something and it failed. Um, and the important thing uh, I think that we need to look for is a culture where, uh, where that's okay, you know? Um, and, and, and the beautiful thing what hap that happened that night is that we shared, all of us shared uh, stories with each other of the, the stomach ache that we sometimes have lying, uh, lying in bed and thinking about uh, our work. And we, we, we normally don't share those stories, um, but we all have them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, actually, your answer also kind of uh, so actually like 
it's okay to also have failures. Is that how I? And and I think Celine was talking about maybe sometimes the complexity as well of donor recipient recipient uh, relations. How does this come together? Because if sometimes organizations are maybe even afraid because of how do you say it? Well, you know, because of maybe they are afraid of the effects of uh, their donors or whatsoever. Like, do you do you talk about that? Uh, I, personally, I think we talk about it insufficiently. In that sense, I do think it's helpful that recently a number of uh, reports have actually come out which have urged all actors working in these fields to be more modest. Mm -hmm. And one report which really uh, stuck to my mind was the recent EO Bay evaluation of uh, interventions, the, uh, the, the international Dutch interventions in fragile states. And that, uh, yeah, the, the, the evaluation basically said that the goals were incredibly lofty, that we were going to like totally change societies, things which are really impossible in the you know in a log frame of five or ten years and that we need to be much more yeah realistic and humble uh, also to avoid some of these failures because if you're you know really talking about huge societal systemic transformations that's really impossible um, at least in the short term so I think uh, this type of reports really help to create an atmosphere that we can be have this more honest conversation but uh, I, yeah it has to happen more definitely Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we can applaud, yes. <laughs> so, uh, another question from online. It's from Marianne. Uh, do you believe that organizations dare to be more uh, vulnerable in sharing negative consequences? I think we... Oh, wow, well, we were on the same line, Marianne. Thank you. I think, I don't know if there's anyone else who would like to add on that, but I think uh, this was already discussed very well. Thank you. And another question from online is uh, stress about unattended effects of policies. Yeah, is there someone who would already like to maybe give a reflection? I heard someone talk about that. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I can effects of policies. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's a very broad question, of course, but what I find interesting, actually, I thought that I was writing this book for development aid and development assistance, but now increasingly other ministries are coming to us and saying, like, and or to me, like, hey, but this is also relevant for what's happening in the Netherlands with our policies. And then I realized, indeed, that the big scandal that we have had here in the Netherlands with the, with the child uh, care system and the allowances, I mean... This is, it's not just something that's happening in development assistance, right? This is across the government uh, board. So, yeah, I do think that, I hope actually that it started in the development sector, but let's yeah, look broader because so many of the th things that are going wrong in our sector, yeah, is a bigger governmental problem. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions from the audience maybe? I see some hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Bram Peters. I work for the UN Capital Development Fund. I was wondering, um, I, and apologies uh, for my ignorance, I haven't read your book yet, so I, I just skimmed through it, so maybe I missed something. But um, in many ways, uh, many of the practitioners, and I'm sure there are quite a number here in the room, are forced or forced or are working more and more with private sector. Uh, in my organization, um, we are working on development finance, uh, working on loans, guarantees, and with that trying to crowd in private sector capital. What, to your opinion, and this is a question to Dirk Jan, uh, what, to your opinion, are the unintended consequences by bringing in that capital from yeah. different, let's say, unusual partners? Yeah. Thank you. There was another question? Yes. Thank you so much. Hello, my, my name is uh, Marijke Priester. I'm an uh, independent advisor now after 35 years in, uh, in international development, mainly in Dutch-based uh, NGOs. And I have a question to, uh, to Dirk Jan. Um, but first of all, congratulations, because it's a dazzling book. It's, it's really, uh, I try to, uh, 
to read it uh, completely. I, I haven't finished it completely, although I did read the conclusion yet. But it's it's really fantastic. It's it's sure. it's it's uh, especially the the practical practical examples. And I also had a feeling when you when I saw on LinkedIn the way you organized your tour of all these uh, happenings like this that you don't like so much unintended consequences because it was very, very firm organized. So uh, <laughs> maybe it's also something in yourself, I don't know. Um, but um, when I look at, uh, and I think that has to do also that unintended uh, consequences are not an objective phenomenon, because um, I don't find so much back from, uh, from opinions from practitioners and policy makers in the South. And when I look at your conclusion, I think maybe that's also a suggestion for a new book. Um, I think your conclusion is quite modest, and I would uh, expect, especially from you, also new ideas about this aid system, because this is all very much within the system, within the, 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 the current system. Mm. And we all know, I just finished a publication in which I interviewed uh, 28 uh, uh, civil society uh, opinion leaders uh, who work in Dutch funded partnerships and so many of them say yeah um, we think of a role for the for the Dutch organization uh, in a very different way so not not so much in all these implementing things that are also part of the of the examples that you give um, would that something for you to consider to also uh, no, continue okay. writing on that subject no. Yeah, you have two questions, and uh, the, good yeah. luck, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, it's okay, well, thank you, Bram, on the uh, inclusion of private actors and what does it do with unintended effects. I think it's a different type of risks that they bring, uh, especially what you see, of course, they are more interested in particular rates of return, which some, th some sectors can be healthy, but there's a risk, of course, that uh, you go to the easier countries uh, or easier sectors and that you do indeed raise a lot more capital but that actually it's not uh, really having the same developmental impact. So I think that's something that you really need to take into consideration while trying to attract more private funding. Uh, Marijke, thank you for your kind words. Uh, and um, I think indeed the book tour, and I have to thank Carla who's standing there, who has been organizing this with me. And uh, you can approach her if you have any questions about the book as well afterwards. Uh, yeah, I got the criticism or criticism, the... the yeah, the remarks when I was presenting last week in, in London from the former Minister of Development, Claire Short, uh, she says that uh, we need a much more solidarity in the international system, we need to have much higher aid budgets, we need to overthrow uh, the current system, and uh, your book is more in the margins, uh, so, uh, seeing how we can reform the current system. So that's how we started the discussion, uh, and in the end she said, okay, Maybe I was a bit too harsh on you in the beginning, Dirk, because now I realize that while we, of course, have to hope that one day we have this big revolution, uh, in the meantime, why don't we start working on your book with some suggestions that we can already start to implement, which they might seem modest, like a ombudsperson in the humanitarian sector, but hey, we have to start somewhere. So that would uh, be my suggestion. Thank you. We still have room for maybe one Maybe two questions. I was also wondering, uh, hearing this or hearing uh, uh, the ideas or other perspective of the other panelists, is this something that, what is your takeaway? I mean, after this day, what are you going to do maybe different within your organization or within your research? Or is there anyone who wants to, or who wants to try to do or to look more better or focus better on the, maybe on the unattended effects? Yes, very carefully, I have two hands, yay, okay. Hi, so I'm uh, Lisette Gotink, and I work as innovation lead for the Dutch Relief Alliance. So um, what I will say is that I will actually read the book, because I haven't, <laughs> but I feel very inspired by this. And I'm actually really uh, appreciative of what Su Ying said, because I actually miss my terminology when I discuss um, humanitarian innovation and change and, and, and system change with my colleagues. So I just want to thank you for that. Yeah, my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you so much. So another one over here. Thanks. My name is Julia McCall. I work um, on monitoring and evaluation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
Um, so there are loads of things going through my head about what to do in monitoring and evaluation, adaptive programming, etc. But one thing I I keep thinking or going back to is is the the system we have for evaluations now, which is very much to go back to the spaghetti bowl, we're following that one piece of spaghetti constantly. Whereas I think this shows us that um, the you need to have an overview, and that means not only following the money in terms of evaluation, and so thinking of ways to move forward in how our evaluation structures are, are built, uh, seeing whether we can work m either more um, together in, uh, like we used to, we used to have a lot of multi-donor evaluations, but that's still donor driven. So mm -hmm. ways of finding how to do evaluations which looks broader than just following the money of one program or, or project. My takeaway. Thank you, thank you so much. Is there s someone else with a takeaway or maybe another question? If not, I would uh, like to thank uh, the two takeaways for sure and uh, I don't know if you can can maybe because I was yeah I was really uh, I found it interesting what what just was said because is it is it our role still to to manage programs and I think someone was talking about it, uh, our role to be implementing programs or should we also move towards a more um, facilitated role and see how we can also have more local communities and other communities maybe to see what we need to do in order to have a more effective um, cooperation, international cooperation. Yeah, and um, then I will stop talking eh, because you've been listening to one and a half hours already, so, and you can go for the drinks, but I think the book is a plea for a more localized response yeah. um, because many of the side effects occur because of the top-down planning mm -hmm. and ideas and structures that we are trying to impose. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, Starting with the research, uh, uh, um, Julia was also responding to that, setting up more local long-term research hubs, uh, which can, from a bottom-up perspective, monitor and reflect on the international presence. I think if we build those more localized structures of monitoring of research, can really help us to, to, yeah, to make sure that less uh, damage is done and more positive things are happening. I think this is a very nice uh, last words and uh, remarks. I uh, I would li really uh, like actually to thank uh, Thea, Stein, Tu Ying and uh, John for uh, your sharing your perspectives and uh, uh, focusing on the local communities and everything what has been said. I think it's already, for me at least, I had a lot of takeaways and I learned a lot. Um, I, I didn't tell this in the beginning, but for me, if we talk about inter -cooperation, international cooperation or facilitating uh, certain uh, partners in foreign countries. I also think it's extremely important to see uh, what we have here in the Netherlands, and that's a big group of diaspora. And the diaspora who is already doing a lot of work, and I would love to see how we can also you know, cooperate actually more with all of these institutions in order to work towards a, uh, a good uh, uh, international cooperation as well. So I would like to thank everyone here. Uh, there are s There is still more room for questions at the bottle, the drinks, the drinks uh, after. And of course, a very, very big thank you for you, Dirk Jan, and good luck with, uh, with the rest of your tour. And there are also books here, right? So for so all of those who would still like to read the book and, and would like to have a hard copy in their hands, uh, you can uh, buy it, purchase it there with Carla. And I think you can have a signed one, right? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye.